today's Oklahoma Olympian, Madeline Manning Mims. At the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City, a 20-year-old Manning became the first American woman ever to win a gold medal in the 800 meters. She remains the only American gold medalist at that distance. Manning's career spanned 14 years as she won 10 national titles and set the American record in the 800 three times. She added a silver medal in the 4x400 relay at the 1972 Olympic Games. She also competed in the 1976 Games and qualified in 1980, but the U.S. boycott of the Moscow Games prevented her from a fourth Olympic appearance. Manny Mims now lives in Tulsa. She's a gospel singer and will be in Rio serving as a U.S. team chaplain for the seventh time. She was inducted into the U.S. National Track and Field Hall of Fame in 1984. Hello and welcome to today's broadcast of She Speaks, brought to you by She Leads America. Today's theme is Against All Odds, and our special guest today, Madeline Manning Mims, exemplifies uh, this theme. Madeline is a gold and silver Olympic medalist in track and a pioneer in the 800 meter run. In 1968, she became the first or I should say the only American woman to win a gold medal in the 800 meters until a thing Mo won at the Tokyo Olympic Games, a 53 year span. Madeline was a member of four Olympic teams for the United States spanning a 16 year international career. She was the first American woman to break the two minute barrier in the 800 meters. And at the 1972 Games in Munich, she won a silver medal in the 4x400 relay. Madeline was inducted into the National and Olympic Halls of Fame. She was honored as an Olympic legend at the 2000 Sydney Olympics. In 2019, she was inducted into the Cleveland Sports Legends Hall of Fame and the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum Hall of Fame. Madeline was also inducted into the Smithsonian African American Sports Museum. She has shared her personal story at the White House and on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. Madeline is founder and president of the United States Council for Sports Chaplaincy, having served as chaplain for the last nine Olympic Games. For six years, she served as chaplain to the former Women's National Basketball Association Shock Basketball Team. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in sociology from Tennessee State University, and she holds a Master of Divinity and Doctorate of Ministry degree from Oral Roberts University. Oral Roberts University awarded her in 2015 the Lifetime Global Achievement Award. Madeline is an author of a book titled The Hope of Glory. She's an international speaker, contemporary gospel recording artist, a nonprofit leader, and member of the Tulsa Jazz Hall of Fame. She lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma with her husband Roderick, aka Rod, and has two adult children, Lana and John. Welcome, Madeline. It's great to have you on today's show. It's wonderful to be here and thank you for inviting me. This is exciting. Well, let's just jump right into it. As I stated, you are just such a, an incredible woman. Um, let's begin with the beginning. A lot of times we look at people who are accomplished like you are and we think that you were born that way. Oh. So let's just look at the beginning because today's broadcast again is against all odds. So let's talk about Madeline Manning, Mims. Uh, tell me about your, your early childhood. Well, when I was um, actually three years old, I had spinal meningitis and the doctors came into the hospital bedroom where I lay and told my mother, we're sorry, but we're going to have to let you know that she doesn't look like she's going to make it. And so my mother, being a prayer wa warrior, a woman of great faith, loving Jesus, uh, just kind of said, mm hmm, and let him go out the door. And the next thing she told me when I was older is that the next morning when they came to re diagnose me, they found out that I was like 50% better than yesterday. 
And they said, we don't know what has happened, but she's doing better. But if she makes it, she's going to be mentally retarded. That's what they called it back then. And physically, she'll never do what the normal child does. And so things looked pretty grim for me at that time. But my mother just kind of looked and said, "Mm mm-hmm. Because I think she figured that if God got me through the night, then he had a plan for my life. And so she told me what I did is I gave you back to the Lord. And I simply said, if you raise up my child and give her back to me, I promise I will raise her up in the ways of the Lord the best way I know how. And she did by exemplifying the love of Jesus through a woman. And being a prayer woman, I used to just listen to her pray and think, she act like she know God. And she did. (laughs) Praise God for that, for a praying mother. Your story Mm -hmm. reminds me of Hannah in the the Bible, the book of uh, Samuel, where she prayed. She said, for this child, I prayed. And when God opened her womb and gave her a seed, a male seed, she gave him back to the Lord. Ah. And so that's what your story reminds me of, the story of Hannah. Beautiful. Well, I tell you one thing. um, My mom's name was Queen, and she definitely was the queen (laughs) of our family. And there were many things that she would pray about, and she would have these dreams. She would, mother had prophetic dreams that you could not keep a secret from her. Because she would know it because the Lord would show show her exactly what was going on in our lives. And, and then she would speak into our lives and counsel us even when we were very young. But I praise God for a praying mother. You're right. Um, I don't know if I'd be here today if Absolutely. it wasn't for her prayers uh, stepping in and and her offering me back to the Lord. Absolutely. Did you sense a special call on your life as you were, you know, from even before your three year that diagnosis at three years old or or after God, as God brought you through it? How did that did you, uh, ex, number one, experience or, or sense a special call upon your life? And number two, mm-hmm. did you experience any um, residual effects of the spinal meningitis as you well, as far as the spinal meningitis, it w- it left me 14 years of fighting for my life. I mean, I was, uh, it was hard when I would try to go to school and be so sick before I got there. Kids didn't understand what I was going through. And so they would make fun of me and call me names and everything. It made me very introverted because of that. Uh, I didn't feel accepted. Um, so I hardly ever talked to anybody. But thank God that his plan uh, ruled all of that out. At six years old, I gave my life to the Lord. Um, It was kind of cute. Through this Sunday school, my mother took us to church. And in this little Sunday school, they gave these little cards out. And my card on that day showed the son, Jesus, um, as the good shepherd. And so this good shepherd was standing in the midst of all of these fat white sheep all around them. And in his arms, he was carrying and holding very close to his heart, a little black lamb. And I saw myself in that picture. And I I went up after everybody was gone and asked my Sunday school teacher, I was like, "Who, who is that? And she said, well, that's a picture of what Jesus is like. He's the good shepherd and he doesn't want the little lambs to get trampled. So he holds them close to his heart. And I said, can he hold me like that? And she said, yes, he can. So we pray. She told me to pray, you know, ask God for forgiveness of things I had done wrong. I gave her a whole list, you know, until she said, finally, she's like, I think he gets the idea. I think he's got it now. And so from that point, I closed my eyes and I felt this warmth like oil from the top of my head just coming all down my body. And it was such a sensation that I opened my eyes and I looked at it and I thought, he's got me. He's got me now. And she said, yes, he does. 
and he loves you, Madeline. Um, that my whole life changed after that because Jesus was not um, figment of my imagination. He became very real to me at a very young age. And I was doing things around the inner city uh, that I thought were natural. I, I didn't know that the, God was doing some supernatural things for me. For instance, when I would go out to play, the moms would send their kids out, I guess for a free babysitter. But I would take care of the kids and I would um, set up the games and, and play and everything. And, and a lot of times, sometimes we would have some kids say, you know, my, my mommy is sick or my grandmother is sick or my cat's sick, you know, whatever. And I would just say, okay, let's pray and ask Jesus to heal him because Jesus can heal. And they would look at me and say, okay. And in our little immature <laughs> way of thinking, we just ask plain out, you know, just God heal so-and-so's mama. God heal so-and-so's grandma. You know, God heal so-and-so's cat or dog. And they would, and it would happen. We, they'd get healed. And I had no idea till later on as I started reading the word of God that God was doing a miraculous supernatural thing in my life at a very young age um, and teaching me how to reach out to other little kids that were around the same age I was. I remember bringing them into the house and feeding them because a lot of them would be hungry. Wow. And I didn't know until much later that we didn't have enough to feed all those kids. But God was multiplying. And we would have enough leftover black eyed peas and cornbread for our family members, and we'd have something left over. We did not have that kind of food because those kids were hungry. They'd be eating two and three platefuls. That's why now, if somebody tried to tell me, well, you know, there is no God, hmm. there, there, I think that yeah, you were just you know, leaning on a crutch. If you would try to tell me that, I, I, that just wouldn't go with me because I've known him since I was a young girl. To me, Jesus was everything. I talked to him about everything. I share with other kids about Jesus, walked the life with him and saw him do all these different things. And it just burst forth yeah. in my heart. And so, it, you know, you can't tell me there is no God and you can't tell me that Jesus is not God and he's not Lord because he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Especially him having uh, manifested in your life at such an early age and, right. and for you to experience such a dramatic healing. Um, you know, you are a woman of destiny and purpose as many of us are. And she speaks, she leads is an outgrowth of women of destiny and purpose. Mm -hmm. And I know that you were uh, you were born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. And there was a turning point in your life. There were turning points within the turning points, as it were, even as the Bible refers to the wheel within a wheel. I believe that's in the yeah. video and God was talking about the angels. But for Madeline Manning Mims, could you talk to um, uh, us about President Kennedy's uh, fitness challenge because that marked a, ch a change, literally a actually a dramatic shift, as it were, in your, your in your young life. Yes, uh, during that time, uh, this was a time when uh, the different nations were testing the physical fitness of their kids, their young people, and I was in high school. And I had to take the physical fitness test, you know, the pull-ups, the push-ups, the agility runs, the jump and all of that stuff. And, and that's really where I was discovered as an athlete. Because before that, I was so shy, I would never have come out for anything. I would have never said anything to anybody. Um, but it's forced me into a situation where I had to do take the test. Well, I made a very high score. And someone came in the next week and beat all my scores. 
and I went to my gym teacher and I said, do you mind if I take this test over again? And she said, no, you can take it as many times as you want. I took the test for three weeks straight every day until she came to me and said, you know, uh, it's closed down now. You can't take it anymore. I said, okay. But when they compilated my scores, they found out that not only was I the best and strongest and fastest uh, female in the school, I was setting national records. And that's when my, my teacher said, you know, you need to get into some type of sport. I said, okay, what you got? And so she said, we have basketball, volleyball, and track. And I went into all three and um, love volleyball. Volleyball was my favorite. I would stay for hours after school and just practice on my serves. And it could actually almost take over a game because I was so concise with hitting the ball. But I also really liked track, but I wasn't really thinking that much about it, but God was. And um, I went out, we went out to, to uh, run in the state meet and I posted some very good times and jumps and things like that. And then my, my teacher said, you know, we need, if we can get one more um, point, more events, in this last one, would you be willing to run the 440 yard dash? And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't want to run. I said, I ran the 220 and that liked to kill me. And now you're trying to kill me twice. I was like, I don't think so. And she said, I tell you what, just go out there and, and just jog around, just jog around the track. You know, you don't have to do anything outstanding, just jog around the track. But see what she knew about me that I didn't know about myself at the time was that if you put somebody in front of me and, and we're running, I'm going to go after them. And so I got in, in the race and didn't know what I was doing. Looked like an ostrich overstriding, you know, <laughs> but I had caught up with everybody by halfway. And then mm -hmm. I was trying to think, what, what do I do now? And I remember my teammates saying, well, just go out there and stretch your legs out. Just stretch your legs out. So I was doing that. But when I came off the last curve, I saw the 100 meters. And that's all I thought about. 100 meters, go. And I take off running, go through the line, finishing first by 50 meters over my competition. Wow. And, and I, so I was so excited that I had gotten 10 points. You know, instead of one. And they said, you know what? Uh, she has no idea what she's done. And I was like, you know, they said, you broke the school record. I was like, is that good? Because if you break something in my mama's house, it is not good. So I, I wasn't sure if this was a good thing that I did or something bad. And they, they left me alone. But there was a man that was watching who became my coach. His name was Alex Varenci. He was Hungarian. He spoke very little English, but he was the coach of the Women's Cleveland Division of Recreation Track Team. And he came over trying to talk to me. I did not understand him. I told go go talk to my mama. She's standing right over there. And so he goes and tries to talk to her too. She don't understand him either. So Miss West, who was my gym teacher, came over and introduced us and said, you know, he is from Hungary and he doesn't speak very much English, but he's watching Madeline run and he wants to train her. And so my mother, of course, being a mom, mm -hmm. was like, well, she ain't going nowhere if she can't get her books done and if she can't eat right and get her rest like she's supposed to, she's not going anywhere. And I was like devastated, of course, <laughs> but he said, no, ma'am. And he explained to her what we do is we try to work with the ladies so that they can get scholarships to go to college. And that's all she did. I don't even think she even understood or heard anything else he said. <laughs> Cause she was like, okay, so where am I to have her at what time? And I'm like, mom, he doesn't speak English. <laughs> She's giving me away. But that, it turned my life around because this man became like a father figure to me. And saw what I did not see in myself. I didn't know anything about the Olympics. I had no idea there was a, such of a thing. Um, I had heard of Wilma Rudolph, 
Mm-hmm. That she was a black lady, that she ran really fast. And I was beating all the boys around the, the project. So I thought, well, maybe one day I can do that. But that's all I thought. But now we're talking about somebody actually training me, you know, to do good things. And it started right there. But that was a God thing because he saw in me. I, I remember you have you've got to hear this little story. We after practice, I mean, he would practice and I, and I would just like be dead. But he would take me home in his car and we would r- ride around in the downtown of Euclid Avenue to, on my way home. And one day he just stops in the middle of the street in a car, gets out his car and starts screaming at the la- top of his voice. One day your name shall be in lights and it shall say Madeline Manning, the Olympic champion. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, coach, get in the car, you know, uh, because you, you didn't see a white man with a black girl screaming in the middle of the street talking about champions. <laughs> so <laughs> it was from that moment on, I really believed that. He really believed in me. He saw something that I didn't see in myself. And he was willing to pay the price to help me find it. You were surrounded by prophets from birth. That was a prophetic utterance if I've ever It was. Heard. Wow. It was. Wow. Before we move into your Olympic uh, participation, let's mm-hmm. go back to something that you shared with us prior to the broadcast. You said that they lost your name tag. When you were in the the, uh, nursery. Maternity ward, yeah. Yes, when you were in the maternity ward. And your father was able to identify you by two distinct characteristics, which really have carried you through today and yet sustained you. What were, could you tell us about that story and what were those characteristics? Because even then he was, your father was prophesying just (laughs) as your Hungarian coach prophesied. My God. They had no idea and neither did I. Isn't it good that the Lord does stuff on your behalf and and you you don't have a clue, you know, but that's why the word of God says he has a plan for you Yes, to prosper you to, and to give you hope and see, and I was so unaware of, I was aware of God, but I was unaware of what he could do and what he was doing in my life. Mm -hmm. And so my dad, Cecil Manning comes into the hospital and they show him where the uh, maternity ward is to go see baby Manning. So he gets there and he asks the nurses, you know, I'm here to see baby Manning. And uh, so they look and look and look and everything. We don't have a baby Manning in here. And he said, yeah, uh, yeah, I just got the phone call to come, you know, and they looked and looked and, and I, over in the corner, there I was kicking my little feet, just kicking up a storm. And I'm hollering at the top of my voice. <laughs> and he said, that's that's the one. That little one over there kicking and hollering, that's my baby. And that's baby right. Manny. And that's what they looked over and they look, I guess they looked around and found the, the plate that goes on to the bassinet. So like, you are right. This is your daughter. <laughs> So even as a baby, my father identified me by my feet Mm -hmm. and by my voice. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. I ran and I, you know, I've been still running for Jesus. Amen. But aside from that, I also sing. And so those two things manifested much later in my life. But uh, (laughs) wow. And Madeline, what was the significance of the picture that you saw, the postcard with the fat white sheep and the one black sheep? That spoke to you. Yes, it spoke to you about salvation, but what did that communicate to the little Manning back then, the six-year-old Manning? Right. At six years old, my dad and my biological dad and my mom had divorced, and I was brought into the... um, into the court and asked, who do I want to stay with? And I said, my mommy and my daddy. Mm. And the judge looked at my mom and said, she doesn't understand. And I looked at him and said, yes, I do. 
I want my mommy and my daddy. And he said, you can't have them both. Wow. And the pain of that was very deep because I didn't understand why. I didn't know what was, my dad was an alcoholic mm -hmm. and um, 28 years went by before the Lord allowed me to lead him back to the Lord. Um, I, I just, you know, during that time, I don't think that people understand how deep a child can hurt. I, I remember praying at, at <laughs> and believing that there was a hell and that my dad was headed headed in that direction. And so I would pray and I was like, please, Jesus, please, Jesus, please, Jesus, don't, don't let, don't let my dad die and go to hell, please, Jesus. And I had this dream that this huge angel came and piggybacked me up into the new Jerusalem. Uh, um, there were um, these stairs that were like escalator stairs. Amazing. It was just beautiful. And, and, <laughs> and when I got up there, he put me down and I was looking around and I thought, it seems like everybody's busy. You know, it doesn't seem like what they say at church every day would be like Sunday and Sabbath will have no end. Well, that meant to me as a six-year-old that I'll be sitting on benches forever and ever and ever. But when I got up there, nobody was sitting on benches. Everybody was busy going around. And I heard the voice of Jesus saying, so what do you think? And I mm. said, don't look like anybody's sitting around. They look like they're busy. And he laughed and he said, yeah, no, it's <laughs> they're busy. And I said, uh, daddy's been a bad boy. Wow. Uh, Maybe you can spank him and and then, um, but don't let him go to hell, mm -hmm. a bad place. And I just thank God today that even at six years old, that I could stand in the gap for my father yes. and believe that Jesus would bring him back. And, and so it was that later on in my 20s, as he was dying in the hospital, the Lord sent me there. And the Lord told me to pray over him uh, and read the scripture about Lazarus. And I said, nope, because Lazarus died and I don't want him to die. And the Lord said, read the story about Lazarus. And I, I finally read it. But when I got to the words, I am the resurrection and the life. Though you were dead, yet shall you live again. And all of a sudden, my dad, who was in a fetal position, sprung out of that fetal position and straightened up and started crying. And I looked at him and I said, Dad, you, did you understand what I said? And he didn't answer. And I said, what it says here is though, even though you've thrown your life away with this alcohol thing and everything, and you're almost like to death, Jesus is telling you he is the resurrection. He can give you life. That's right. And he looked at me and he said, for the first time in months, you don't know what I've done. And I said, daddy, it doesn't matter that I know. I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. But Jesus knows and he can do something about it and he wants you back. And at that moment, my dad just cried and he just said, Father, if you can just take me back. And from that moment on, his life switched and he started getting better and better each day. And long story made short, God added 15 more years to his life. And he got a chance to see my youngest child, little Lana before he passed away. Um, so God is, I mean, he's just awesome. Oh, he's faithful. He's so faithful. So yeah. let's go back to you were about 20 years old when you received your first gold medal. Is that right? That's right. So let's talk about that because it was your mother's prayers that were birthed in you, probably yeah. from the womb. And you are a child of promise, hmm. even as Samuel. Even as Moses, you were a special child. I can go through the Bible and just mm -hmm. identify Madeline throughout the pages of the Bible. It's just so <laughs> great. 
and you're sitting here today, feet, legs, mouth, all of it is, is being used to proclaim <laughs> the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you participated in four Olympic games spanning a 16 year period. 1968 was your first that launched you. 1972, 1976, and 1980, you qualified. You didn't go simply because the U.S. boycotted Russia, I believe. So let's talk about two of the four. And of course, if you want to comment on the other two, you can. But specifically, 1968, which was historical, uh, historic, and then 1972. Now, in 1968, Madeline, you were in Mexico City and you won the gold medal for the 800 uh, meter uh, race. What did it feel like <laughs> for you to win that medal? And what were your thoughts? Look at you. Uh, well, I happened to bring my medal this morning with me so you could wow. see it. Wow. And I'm telling you, when they put that around my neck, my life flashed before me. I mean, it's like things just start videotaping reruns, reruns of my life. And I, I saw myself getting there, you know, getting to this place, hearing the national anthem sung behind me. Um, and it, it was almost unreal because, you know, when you train, you do the same thing over and over and over and over. Um, and so you have, it takes time to realize that you actually accomplished what you came here for. You came here to win. You came here to give it your best. To to and winning is different things for different people. It doesn't mean that everybody gets a gold medal. But if you did your very best, then you're you're a winner. And um, but to have the icing on the cake is to you know get a medal. And so to have the medal. Now, what was so special about this was that people at that time thought that women of color could not, it was a myth, they could not run long distances. Um, they had fast twitch muscles and they were better at the short sprints. But the, the fact that I won with such a space between me and my competition, let them know that that was completely uh, unfathomable. It was just not true. And I didn't realize at that time that I was opening a door for women of color globally to run distance. And, and you look at it today and they, I mean, they dominate. Women of color from all over the world dominate in the, the long distances now. So, uh, but during this time in 68, nobody believed in me. I, I remember having read out of a magazine, a very uh, huge sports magazine they did three pages on 800 the 800 meter women in the world and at the end of it the only thing they said about me was and look for madeline manning from the united states well the weird thing about it is that everybody they had talked about i had beaten for the last two years i was undefeated but now, you know, I wasn't looked at to even be in the finals. So I, you know, it was amazing that this was going on. Things were going crazy in our, our land in the United States, you know, burning stuff. And I mean, I even had an experience coming off of the track at Tennessee State University, trying to get to my dormitory or either to the cafeteria with people coming on to the campus and shooting, just shooting guns in the air. Now, any of those bullets could have just flown and hit me uh, or anybody who was in the space. But I mean, it was a lot of chaotic, chaotic movement happening in our nation. And of course with Vietnam and then um, Martin Luther King being assassinated and it, and then Robert Kennedy. It was just a mass of madness. And in the midst of that, God had chosen me to win. It, it, I never can get over that. 
why he chose me at that time to win the 800 meters. Um, you know, with Tommy Smith and John Carlos, you know, they were fighting for human rights. They were totally misunderstood that, you know, was saying that they were um, dis disrespecting the flag, disrespecting our nation when it was not that at all. They had come out of a hard situation to get where they were and they were on top. And that was the time to speak out your heart. And their heart was to see people of all races, all nations, you know, unify as one and not be treated as slaves or as less than human. And, but I was so young, I had no idea what was going on. You know, I, I was good friends with Tommy, very close to Tommy. I knew John, um, but Tommy was very soft-spoken. He, he didn't have a lot to say, but when he did speak, everybody listened. And so he told us, he called us all together, the whole team. And he said, listen, I know there are people talking about boycotting the games and stuff like that, but I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. So I'm, cause I know many of you look and, and wonder what am I going to do? He said, I came here for one reason, and that is to win the gold in the 200 meters. So I'm going out to win. I'm going to run. I'm going to win, you know, and I'm not asking anybody what I should do or how I should do or whatever I should do. I'm just, that's the first thing. And then once I make my platform, I'll have the right to speak. And so everybody is like a relief because we didn't know, like, are we all being asked to do this? To, you know, <laughs> and he clarified, no, no, you're not being asked to go against anything that you um, don't feel in your heart that is who you are. So I, I praise God for that because in the middle of that, that helped me to make up my mind that I'm running for Jesus. Amen. And that's exactly what I did. In fact, mm -hmm. Sylvia, at that mm -hmm. game, after I had um, come off of the podium and I was uh, greeted by a uh, ABC commentator mm -hmm. and he was saying, you know, we're so excited about you winning and, and I'm still trying to figure out why are you that excited because didn't you expect me to win if I had been winning? And he said, um, you do all of this. Now, this is how the Holy Spirit jumps in. You do all of this for um, the glory of what, you know? And, and when he said glory, I looked at him and I thought, why did he ask me that? But see, he expected me to respond like for my country, for mm -hmm. the United States of America, or they brought in my mother, you know, and for my mom and my family, you know, or for myself, you know, I, you know, I got all the glory. It's me, 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 me. But there was only one answer to that question that I had. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, I'm doing all of this for God. I'm running for yes. Jesus. Yes. And he looked at me as I think that was the first time anybody had actually shared their faith on television in the sports world. And um, I remember him saying, we're not talking about religion here. And I said, I'm not either. I'm trying to answer your question. And he said, we'll be right back right after these messages. And he cut me off and walked away. But the thing was, it was too late. The whole world heard me say I was running for Jesus. And the glory went to God. So let's shift to 1972. Mm -hmm. uh, I shared with you that I was a, a, a young girl in, in a, a part of Germany. And I remember seeing the what happened at the 1972 Olympics in Munich unfold. Yeah. yeah. So just to kind of give our uh, viewers a backdrop, it was in the early morning of September 5th, 1972, when a group of Palestinian terrorists, so it's not just a buzzword of today. Right. 1972, when a group of Palestinian terrorists stormed the Olympic Village apartment of the Israeli athletes. They killed two and they took nine Israeli athletes hostage. 
the yes. terrorists were a part of a group known as Black September. So in return for the release of the nine Israeli hostages, they demanded that Israel release over 230 Arab prisoners that were being held in the Israeli jails and two German terrorists. So in an ensuing shootout at the Munich airport, the nine Israeli hostages were killed along with five of the terrorists and one West German policeman. You, Madeline, uh, witnessed this event. Is that correct? Yes, I did. This is the medal that I won from those games. This is the silver medal that I ran in a lot of pain to get for the uh, four by four Olympics uh, relay for the United States. And that, that that that's a story within a story because mm, what you saw story. in the background was the dormitory of the women's track and field team we stayed there we were right across from them not maybe 20 feet or so uh between the spaces mm -hmm. of our dormitories that morning um one of our girls, I came running through through the hall, screaming and hollering and cursing. And I was, now we knew she was kind of like wild, mm -hmm. but she wasn't that wild. And we knew something was wrong when uh, my roommate, Cheryl Tucson, got up and said, oh, what is she ranting about? And she said, I'll go see and I'll tell, I'll come back and I'll tell you. Um, I waited, I waited, and I she didn't come back. So I finally got up myself and I went down the hall and I saw the room door open, but I didn't see anybody in it. And then when I looked out, they were everybody was on the porch. And so I went through and I got on the porch and I went up in the front by the railing and I said, What's going on? You know, what's happening? They said, We don't know. Uh, the men in black suits are out there and you're talking to this guy uh, on the porch and we didn't know we saw sharpshooters we didn't know they were sharpshooters because they had on on uh, athletic attire but they were laying on top of the building and we i mean we had no clue what they were we were pointing at them go oh they gonna get in trouble you know, wait, they're not supposed to be up there. We didn't realize that we were pointing out the sharpshooters. <laughs> and fi finally, the guy comes out, the head guy of Black September comes out to talk to the German people delegation that were down there trying to get them to let the guys go. And when he turned to the side, all of a sudden we saw a gun, a rifle on his shoulder and realized now that's a machine gun. And all of us turned at the same time to run for the door to get out, to get out of harm's way. The problem is, is that I was standing in front of the rail. So all of the girls actually blocked the door. And you know how girls are, they're going to scream and holler, they're screaming and hollering. And all I could think of is this guy is going to get agitated and turn around and just rivet me with bullets because my back is toward him. And I'm thinking it was the most frightening thing in my life that I had ever experienced before. Finally, one of our uh, shot putters went up to the door with one arm, pushed everybody back and opened the door and everybody went flying through. Later on, um, we were down actually in the, the men's basketball uh, dormitory, which had a huge uh, monitor screen for us to look at because we wanted to see what was happening on TV. Um, and the guys were out because they had locked down the Olympic Village. You couldn't get in and you couldn't get out. So they had been practicing and were locked out. So we knew nobody was there. I was standing there looking out the window. Um, this was after they had taken the, the, the victims on the bus. They were 
hands tied, feet tied, blindfolded, taking them on the bus and taking them outside of the village. Um, what, what happened then, I, it's hard for me to explain, but I started sweating and, and just shaking. And Cheryl looked at me and said, what's wrong? And I said, I don't know. I feel like somebody's going to kill me. I, I don't know what this is. I'm, I don't know what. And she said, oh, no, nobody, it, they're out of here. They're not going to hurt you anymore. I said, I know, but I don't know why I'm feeling like this. So she said, Let, let's go back and look at the TV again, see what's going on. So we go back, we sit down and the the one of the newscasters is saying, you know, they've come now and um, the two groups are in two separate helicopters waiting and um, uh, the guy is going to get on the flight and see if everything's okay and if the the pilot is on there uh, then they'll let them go but all of a sudden and Cheryl said to me see everything's okay and I was like yeah I guess so but all of a sudden all hell broke loose. You saw bullets flying. You saw people screaming. The, the newscasters were screaming, oh my God, oh my God. And this guy who had a, a camera was on the ground rolling around and you could see what was happening. The first thing you saw was the first helicopter just blow up, go up into flames. Well, we knew that the Israeli, some of the Israeli uh, athletes and coaches were on that on that helicopter and they had just blown it up. All of a sudden you saw somebody else running across the tarp and some, the guy hollering, telling him to kill them, kill them in the other uh, helicopter. And all of a sudden the guy, got shot by by one of the uh, German sharpshooters who was out there but as he was as he was going down he threw a grenade into the second helicopter and you could see the guys trying to kick trying to find out where the, the grenade was and trying to kick it out of the helicopter and were not able to and it blew up and all I remember is seeing them riff in flames and i thought oh my god this is what i felt wow. i felt the death of these men mm. and i i just cried i just cried our nation our world was just in in tumult and in deep grief Aside from that, I, I, I call this in my book, Running for Jesus, uh, the hope of glory also, my hell year. Because aside from that happening, I still had the four by 400 meter relay to run. And, and in a few days before that, in practice, I pulled a muscle right behind my knee on my right leg. And I was in so much pain and uh, they had, they worked on me and everything, but I finally was able to run. To this day, out of the 400 meters that I ran, 300 meters, I felt pain, I was hurting, but the last 100 meters right before I passed off to Cheryl, I don't even know what happened. And when I went back to visit, I asked the Lord, I stopped right at the place where I didn't know, I just said, have mercy. And the next thing I know, I was passing off to Cheryl. Uh, but he said, this is where I picked you up and carried you through. Mm -hmm. So very interesting games there. Mm -hmm. How powerful, how powerful against all odds. Yeah. The prayer or the mantle of prayer is not only prophetic, but it's also, it has intercessory connotations. And it's interesting, Madeline, that you felt the impending doom that was going to take place on that fateful day. 
of yeah. September 5th, 1972. That is remarkable. So in today's society, because the world is still in tumult, it still is in chaos and terror and fear. And so in today's society, when there are school shootings or uh, some something tragic happens, they a lot of times the uh, educational system or the business or whatever it is will provide counseling for those who are in need. Now, how did you survive such trauma? Very good question. Um, there were no counselors. There were no chaplains. That's why I do what I do today. Tell us about it. There was nobody to talk to. I almost threw a Coke bottle through a window because I was so overwhelmed at one point. When my coach got had the opportunity to get back into the village, we went to eat and I was sitting there and everything hit me. And I, I just, I grabbed this Coke bottle, it wasn't mine, but somebody's, and I was about to throw it through a window of the restaurant when uh, the coach's wife caught me, caught my hand and everything. I ended up running into the bathroom, into a stall and just screaming and hollering and beating the, the stall, you know, and mm -hmm. and she let me and then she, she talked me finally to open the door so she could get in. Um, the need for that type of trauma is deep, you can't, just stuff it down and no you can't try to make it through life mm -hmm. with that there but i'm so glad for the holy spirit because mm -hmm. he just held me and comforted me with the situation being as it was you know not only the black september group but also the the injury that took place um, and how he just picked me up and carried me through my leg of the relay so that we could get the silver medal. We would have gotten a gold medal had I not gotten hurt. That was a definite. Um, but as it was, we still broke the world record. Of course, the East Germans broke the world record and won. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we did our best and, and, and uh, it was just a hard time. I, I tell, I have that little cliche, you have to pay the cost to be the boss. That's right. You've got to earn the, the respect, the, the, the love, the accolades. The, you've got to earn that with a life that has been given to you at zero because you have it in you, but it, you have to develop it. You have to be willing to do what's necessary to, to uh, get the award. So. Absolutely. So tell us, Madeline, what is God's mandate for your life today? You had a mandate leading up to now. So what is his land, uh, mandate? You, were, you uh, referenced passing the baton, which is right. a good uh, visual because mm -hmm. um, you're closer now to eternity than you were when you were first born. So yep. you're, 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 you're still pioneering and you're in the process as you pioneer of passing the baton. And so what is God's mandate now on this leg of your journey? Of your All of this, my whole life was, as I look back at it, and, you ha and this happens when you get older. <laughs> you begin to look back and realize, oh, that's how this piece fit in the puzzle. And it's like your life is a puzzle and, and God is, there's certain things that, go into the puzzle and fit together and others that don't. Um, when I look back on everything, I realize all this was a platform. In fact, I asked the Lord, a, a lot of things are happening in my life right now. And I don't understand why they're happening now. 